Thank you, Erica, for the warm uh, introduction. I uh, thank you, Greg, for your words and for especially welcoming me and inviting me to, uh, to be here uh, to give this year's, or is it last year's as well? <laughs> last year's Bainton. So I have two Bainton lectures, I guess. <laughs> last year and, 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 and this year. Um, to honor the memory, incredible memory and legacy of Professor Ron Baton. As you are uh, describing his uh, focus and interest in both the, uh, the history of the church, but also the concern for the church for social justice, and I, I was really uh, fascinated. And uh, the anecdotes that you give about his uh, energy and riding his bike at uh, 90, uh, that's, that, that, that is something. <laughs> Uh, what a joy for me, what an honor for me to be here, finally uh, uh, at Yale. I think this is my first time to be at Yale and been very, very much looking forward to, to this time. Uh, to see and connect with uh, old friends and uh, to meet new friends as, as well. I would like to dedicate uh, my lecture uh, this evening to the memory of Professor Lamen Sane, I beloved uh, colleague, well admired, and from whom I learned a great deal. A lot from his scholarship, um, quite an inspiring uh, uh, scholar, as well as his personal journey, his personal journey uh, of what it means to be summoned from the margins. As I read his memoir, uh, appropriately entitled Summoned from the Margins, uh, I cannot but think about my own pilgrimage. Uh, from the margins of Malube, the village where I was born, being summoned, if you like, being on a pilgrimage that now brings me here uh, to Yale at Divinity School. But also, I cannot but think about my increasingly feeling being summoned back uh, to the margins. Um, and that's what I want to talk about this evening, my pilgrimage, my journey of being summoned back uh, to uh, the margins. Uh, I would like to do so by beginning to, by sharing a few uh, images and the uh, slides of the work that I'm doing at Bethany Land Institute in Uganda. Uh, this would give me an opportunity to reflect on the broader questions about the church's witness uh, to justice and peace in the world, concerns that Professor Benton uh, had in his life and in his work. But it will also give me an opportunity to think about and reflect on what I'm learning as I'm engaged in this work, what I'm learning about ecclesiology, about theology, about the mission of the church, and about world Christianity uh, in this effort. And I would like to do so by raising and reflecting around three questions. The how, the what, and the why. The how, how is this work connected to the work that I've been doing, especially in political theology? To the what, what is at stake in this work? And to the why, why Bethany, Bethany Land Institute? Uh, so briefly, Bethany Land Institute, Founded in 2015, inspired by Pope Francis, uh, especially Laudato Si, um, the mission of which is forming leaders for integral, in integral ecology for the transformation of rural uh, communities. Briefly, the journey that in a way kind of leads me to this is a journey that has seen me uh, going back and forth uh, in Uganda, East Africa, and other places in Africa, and witnessing such a scenes like this, increasing uh, ecological degradation, deforestation being so uh, high everywhere. Um, I grew up in the village that was surrounded by a huge natural forest. Over the years as I have gone back, this is what now it looks like. Uh, the forest has been cut down. The stream where we drew water when I was a young boy has dried up or is drying up and now it's used as mud water for making bricks. As a result, the crops are miserable looking as they are. And the land overall, in a way, 
has lost its first heat. These are images uh, that you find not only in my home native village, but in villages across Africa. And going hand in hand with that is the growing movement, especially of young people, away from the villages into the city, as the city beckons, promising employment, promising good life. The challenge is that many of them never end up really in the cities. They end up in, caught up in the slums, uh, living in what uh, Davis called a life of exile. Um, and cities are growing at a terrific rate in, the, uh, in, in, in Africa, but slums are growing at even a faster rate. Um, the projection was by 2015, there will be over 350 million uh, Africans living in slums. That proved to be an understatement. And it's projected now that by 2030, over 1.5 billion uh, Africans will be living in these kind of uh, settlements, so-called informal settlements or slums. The question that I see on the faces of many of these young people who have no work, unemployed, are questions like, who am I? Why am I even here? Do I even matter? What is life? The whole question of who am I, or question of human dignity. In 2012, when I was celebrating 25 years as a priest, I started talking with some of my colleagues, priest friends, and I said, well, I needed to plant a forest, because I was very attached to the forest that I knew growing up, and I wanted just 10 acres of land in the community to plant a forest. And so I was asking one of my colleagues if he knew of a place that I could buy 10 acres of land. Uh, that's Cornelius, the, the big guy in the uh, black uh, T-shirt. And he said, well, you know what? The issues are connected also to the education, the way we teach our young people not to value uh, traditional life, not to value the village, but it's only the city that kind of promises, you know, the kind of really modernity uh, that is inscribed within the education program. He's an educationalist. And he said, well, it's not only kind of planting trees and forest, but the whole education mind has, said has to change. Another priest colleague actually joined the conversation and said, well, you know what, all you're talking about, planting forests and so forth, people have to live. Unless you bid in an economic dimension, you may plant all the trees that you want, but people are going to cut them down to, to feed their families. So that's when we started talking about the three E's. I was more really interested in ecology and the environment. Cornelius was talking about education and uh, Tony, brought in the economic dimension. So we started talking about to, uh, the three E's. We bought some land in the community, that's the land in the background. And we kind of said, well, maybe we are going to build a school, uh, maybe a farm. We really didn't know what we wanted to do until uh, 2015, uh, when Pope, uh, Francis published this encyclical letter on the care for our common home, uh, Laudato Si. And he was making a number of very, very incredible uh, connections. The cry of the earth and the cry of the poor go together. The ecological problem and the social problem are connected. You've got to listen to both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. He was also calling for integrated approach and integral ecology that he is able not only to uh, fight poverty, care for creation, but also restore human uh, dignity. And also importantly, he said that this cannot be just kind of done from a kind of a technological point of view program. You need uh, a different way of thinking a different way of looking at things, an education program, a lifestyle, and spirituality. So we said, well, this, this, this seemed to be, in a way, at the heart of what we were uh, thinking, and, but we didn't know, we didn't have what we so we said, well, let's just build something like that, that kind of responds uh, to that integrated approach or integral ecology. So we started bringing together, actually, on the land that we had bought, started bringing together young people from the rural communities, especially those that had been deemed failures because they had fallen off the education ladder, and kind of really uh, reading with them uh, this encyclical Audato C, but also trying to cultivate the land in a sustainable way. We called the young people caretakers from the biblical uh, injunction, Genesis chapter 2, verse 14, to the land and care for it. Um, I would say a little more about uh, this, this small book, so it's from Bethany, but we did want it to be based on a land, the land kind of uh, issues that are connected with land, not only about the scarcity of the land, but the whole uh, spirituality that is connected with the land. So we wanted to call it a land 
uh, institute. Institute to capture the educational uh, aspect of, of, of that. And so three programs uh, on this that has kind of grounded within the stories of Bethany, we, we shall come back to that, uh, Mary's Farm, uh, Lazarus Trees, and Martha's Market. Mary's Farm, Mary, the one who sits down at the feet of Jesus, listens. Uh, this is an educational program that teaches young people uh, tilling the land, caring for the land, for creation in sustainable ways. Um, the reason I wanted to call it Mary again is to stress the kind of the formation dimension of it, the listening. It's one of the caretakers uh, taking care of, of her pig, and they have some animals there on the farm, uh, crops, and then a forest. We have a forest, we continue to do uh, planting that we called Lazarus. After the Lazarus was sick and died but was brought back to life, that, that is something like that we wanted to see happening in terms of the ecology uh, in Africa, the environment. And so uh, uh, taking care of this natural forest of the parish that was encroached on, uh, over 60 acres of that that had been already uh, deforested and planting trees in a way every opportunity, setting a target for one million trees by the year 2050 at this land, but also in the rural communities. Oh, this is just a picture of one of me, my students that uh, on a course I did last year. Um, and then uh, Martha's Market, uh, that kind of brings together the young people in a kind of a cooperative uh, arrangement, marketing, leadership skills, uh, saving, uh, they already have uh, a savings and credit union. Here I think they had just finished a meeting and they are having lunch for their markets. But really at the heart of whatever they produce, in a way finding a market, uh, to kind of really be that kind of economic model that can uh, sustain them as they till uh, the land. Uh, the crops and markets. In 2019, the diocese uh, saw the efforts that we are doing and said, well, let's partner. So we partnered with the diocese of Casanaluero, and actually they were able to give us over 280 acres of land um, that now uh, we started actually uh, going deep and building uh, an, 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 an institute. That's uh, uh, the parish land at this old church founded in uh, 1890, the first parish in that part of the world. Um, that is where BLI is located. So we built uh, dormitories for our caretakers, and um, some not as good as the Yale dorms, but well, there's something. <laughs> yeah. So this is the official. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. This is actually the official uh, launch of the institute uh, early this year in March. Uh, with the bishop, who, uh, with the caretakers that are these young boys and girls that are determined to transform the rural communities through integral uh, ecology. Here uh, on the day of the, the opening, uh, a month after the opening, the bishop saw that what we are doing, I think, was a great approach. He, he called and said, well, you know what, I want to bring my seminarians to study with these young people at the institute uh, because that is the those are the communities they are going to, uh, to, to, to work in. So the seminarians came and they would wake up, go to mass, and after mass they would take off their cassocks and join the other young people in working uh, on the fields. When they came, many of them didn't like it. They came kicking and screaming and saying, for God's sake, we are doing theology. What are we doing taking us to work with the uneducated people in the community and so forth and so on. After four months, they didn't actually want to leave. They had established a community and really uh, the work of uh, engaging and tilling the land had brought them uh, into a deeper communion, not only with the caretakers, with one another, the seminarians, with themselves, with God, and with the land. So, let me see. So caretakers in class A, caretakers in class B, the land kind of really uh, doing sustainable agriculture, setting up um, facilities for the animals. The hope is that once they graduate, they are able then to go in the rural communities and establish similar uh, programs of integral ecology, mentor two, three young people every year, 
and become leaders in their community. So the structures that we're doing, simple enough that they can be, in a way, reproduced. Or working with the community in terms of uh, um, ecological education, uh, tree planting, education uh, creation care, uh, picking up trash. Uh, so that's what's actually happening. That's what's actually right now going on at uh, the Bethany Land Institute. And that's uh, our, our website. So you can go uh, on and uh, uh, see more if you are interested. Three questions that I want to reflect on briefly. The first question, how does this work connect with what I've been doing uh, in theology, more specifically in political theology? For most of my work has and continues to be in the broad area of political theology. I've been particularly interested in understanding the patterns of war, of violence and poverty and instability in Africa. My interest is both theological and missional. What difference does Christianity in general, the church in particular, make in Africa's turbulent social history? So employing the notion of the social imagination, I have argued that the realities of war and violence are wired within the imaginative landscape of Africa's modernity. What we need, more than prescriptive recommendation of how to end poverty, make democracy work, or bring warring parties to the negotiating table, important as these are, what we need are new stories, foundational stories, new mythoi that can underwrite new social, social imaginaries within which peace and integral human development can take shape. In the sacrifice of Africa, I not only make this argument, but also display how the church matters in this critical task of social imagination. A social imagination of Africa's identity, politics, and economics. This is what I call the work of hope, which I argue is the unique contribution the church makes in the search for peace. In Born from Lament, I studied the nature and relevance of hope for peace building by probing the deep interconnectedness between lament and hope in the biblical tradition. But also I make explicit the practical and peaceful dimensions of hope. This is a beautiful uh, work, but two conclusions in a way stood out forcibly for me from this work born from lament. First, the study confirmed to me, that all theology is an account of hope. All theology is an invitation to give an account of hope that Peter invites us into. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Be willing to give an account of the hope that is in you. But also, that any such account of hope has the cross at the center has, in other words, the reality of what John Baptist Metz calls the dangerous memory of God's suffering. Secondly, but connected to the first, that as David Tracy notes, the reality of God's suffering drives the Christian not, far into, not, not into further theological speculation, but to the memory of suffering in the world and the struggle for, with, and on behalf of the suffering and marginalized peoples of history. This is what makes theology for Tracy, as for John Baptist Metz as well, a form of social engagement, a form of political theology. Elizabeth Johnson describes this as the poetics of compassion. Compassion, suffering with, of solidarity, which she describes as an empowering power. Neither power over nor powerlessness, but power with. That issues from this dangerous memory of the suffering of God. The poetics of compassion is at the same time an invention. I describe this in Who Am I People as the invention of love, the invention of God's suffering love. Here, the argument is that the story of God's suffering love does indeed create something new 
in the world. It invents new identities, new social possibilities, new realities in the world. In the end, I argue that it is this invention of love that, that, that is the antidote to Africa's violent modernity. So this argument that I'm going to pick up in uh, Who Are My People, soon to be published. But, but something new the, for me in this work of Who Are My People is that for the first time, I extend my analysis on violence to the social crisis for the first time. In which I describe, which I describe this ecological violence using the words of Rob Nixon as slow violence. And make the argument that the ecological crisis and the other forms of violence, they are not two separate forms of violence. They are two iterations, if you like, two modalities of the same crisis of belonging. But the issue that I want to deal with, that I'm dealing with in this, uh, is can this slow violence be reinvented? Can it be reversed? And how? So in many ways, I see Bethany Land Institute as an extension of this argument. For a while in Who Are My People, I engage these questions from a theoretical point of view. Bethany Land Institute is a practical experiment, a demonstration of this reinvention of the ecological crisis, or what Parenti calls the catastrophic convergence of poverty, violence, and climate change. This experiment draws heavily from Pope Francis's Laudato Si, where he calls for an integrated approach to fight poverty, care for creation, and restore human dignity. He calls for an integrated approach. In that encyclical, as he describes it, what he's driving to is the integral ecology. He calls for an integral ecology. But Francis also notes that integral ecology is the true meaning of love or caritas. He writes in Laudato Si, and I quote, love overflowing the small gestures of mutual care is also civic and politic, and it makes itself felt in every action that seeks to build a better world. Love for society and commitment to the common good are outstanding expressions of a charity, which affects not only relationships between individuals, but also macro relationships, social, economic, and political ones. End of what? Macro relationships, social, economic, and political ones. In other words, social love is the key to integral human development, the key to integral ecology. I quote again from Laudato Si, in order to make society more human, more worthy of the human person, love in social life, political, economic, and cultural, must be given a renewed value, becoming the constant and highest norm of all activity. End of quote. Love in social life, political, economic, and cultural, must be given renewed value, becoming the constant and highest norm for all activity. Bethany Land Institute, as I understand it, is an experiment in this social love. And as such, it is a form of politics. For as Francis notes in another encyclical Flatelli Tutti, Flatelli Tutti, I quote, for whereas individuals can help others in need, when they join together in initiating social processes of fraternity and justice for all, they enter the field of charity at its most vast, namely, political charity. This entails working for a social and political order whose soul is social charity. To be honest, this is what I have found to be the most challenging and all-consuming, time-consuming aspect at Bethany Land Institute building structures and institutions, structures and institutions 
that enhance solidarity and institutionalize the kind of love or caritas that undergirds and appeals integral ecology, building structures and institutions. And yet, it is very much needed. It is very much necessary. It is required or commanded. For as Francis notes in Flatteri Tutti, I quote, there is a kind of love that is elicited, whose acts proceed directly from the virtue of charity and are connected to individuals and peoples. But there is also a commanded love expressed in those acts of charity that spur people to create more sound institutions, more just regulations, more supportive structures. It follows that it is an equally indispensable act of love to strive to organize and structure society so that one's neighbor would not find himself in poverty. End of quote. Bethan Land Institute, for me, represents, therefore, a culmination and an extension of my work in political theology. I am doing political theology at BLI. But also at BLI, this work has given me, given me an opportunity now to see more clearly what my work has been about all along. Talk about doing things that you don't have the full picture, the full understanding of what it is all about. BLI, in, in many ways, has given me a chance to see what my work has been about all along. For in the sacrifice of Africa, I argued, following Bezo Davidson, that the challenge of modern Africa had to do with the social and political institutions within which colonized Africans have to live and survive. I argued that those had to be reimagined. At BLI, I am involved in a very small way, no doubt, in reimagining, reinventing these institutions. And what a daunting task it is. But also what an exciting task it is. For it also offers me a unique opportunity to investigate the possibilities and the limits of social imagination, to investigate those possibilities and limits both in their theoretical but also practical dimensions. So as a question of how is this connected, it is a more concrete engagement investigation of love in its many dimensions. What is at stake? As I mentioned, in Who Are My People, I extend for the first time my theoretical work on violence to the ecological crisis in Africa. I argue that the different forms of violence in Africa, including war, poverty, and ecological degradation, do not represent different forms of violence, but modalities of the same crisis, a crisis of belonging within post-colonial Africa. In other words, the ecological crisis is at its heart a spiritual problem, a crisis of belonging. At the beginning of Laudato Si, Pope Francis notes that we have lost a deep connection to the earth. And this is what makes the ecological crisis a spiritual crisis. I quote, we have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. End of quote. We have forgotten what it means to belong to the earth. That is why for Francis, we need more than technological or economic adjustments to respond to the ecological crisis, important as these are. We need an education program that can cultivate a new kind of mindset 
a distinctive way of looking at things, a way of thinking, a lifestyle, and importantly, a spirituality. A spirituality that will reconnect, reconnect us to the earth and thus to one another and to God. Spirituality is at the heart of BLI's program. The goal of Mary's Farm is not simply to train caretakers in the skills of sustainable agriculture. The goal is formation. It is a formation program in the discipline and practices of listening, attentiveness, listening to the land, listening to the earth. But in the process of listening to the earth, listening to oneself, listening to others' community, and listening to God, the spiritual dimension. In this connection, we try to recover and draw from African native spiritualities. For the latter encourage a mystical approach to nature, a view of nature as imbued with a sense of the sacred. African native spiritualities encourage a respect and listening to nature, but also a participation and a collaboration with nature so that work is a collaboration that human, give, human beings give to nature. A sense of participation, a sense of sacredness, a respect, a sense of symbolic, uh, mystical view of the universe. Unfortunately, under the assault of the colonial and modernizing technocratic paradigm, these native spiritualities continue to be dismissed or denigrated as pagan, as primitive, and backward. They are what stand in the way of development, we are told. They have to be eradicated. Unfortunately, this type of development has only resulted in that catastrophic convergence of poverty, violence, and climate change. This is what we want to reverse by suggesting a different vision of development. One that is grounded within the African world view. One that is grounded literally within the African soil. If a deep sense of participation and belonging is at the heart of the African native spiritualities, that spirituality is inexorably connected to the soil, more specifically to land. Land which in many ways serves as what Magessa calls the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord that connects the past, the present, and the future, that connects the spiritual and the mundane, the individual and the community, the earth, the world above, and the underworld. Land as the umbilical cord that connects. Our interest in land at BLI is not merely economic, land as a resource. Our interest is primarily spiritual. For as the sociologist Betty Ocott notes in Africa, land, I quote, land means more than real estate. It isn't just a slice of the earth which can be farmed, inherited, bought, built on, sold, transferred. Land equates to history, to heritage, identity, belonging, rights, and relationships. It creates social security and helps define social, cultural, religious values and belief systems. However, when these collide with the idea of commoditizing land, the people who live on the land and those who work on it and the land itself suffer. End of quote. Land is a spiritual reality. It is a similar sentiment that Pope Francis is voicing when he notes that for native and indigenous peoples, I quote, land is not a commodity, but rather a gift from God and from their ancestors who rest there, a sacred space with which they need to interact if they are to maintain their identity. 
and values, end of quote. This is what we're trying to get at at BLI. Rooting, again, another agricultural metaphor, rooting integral ecology, integral human development in the African soil, which is to say in African spirituality. In doing so, we hope to foster a dialogue between Christian and African spiritualities, between modern visions of flourishing and African sacred and mystical forms of land and creation here. Okay. This is what is at stake, the question of belonging, a new sense of identity, a sense of spirituality, that kind of in a way responds to the question marks of all these young people who are stuck in the slums, who am I? Do I even matter? Where do I belong? That is the interest that we have in the question of land. The third question that we're getting to is, why? Why Bethany? And this kind of gets to the heart of the ecclesiological issues that are at the heart of my work. I have had a growing interest in the village of Bethany in the New Testament. In 2012, I undertook a three-week research trip to Israel and Palestine, which culminated in a small book, Stories of Bethany, on the faces of the church in Africa. That was published by Paulines in 2013. I was in search of biblical Bethany and its significance during the time of Jesus' ministry. I was fascinated by the number of times that this village, Bethany, comes up in the New Testament stories. Some more familiar than others. We are very familiar with the story of Martha. Jesus entered a village called Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed him to her house. We are familiar with the story of Mary, her sister, Luke chapter 10, verse 38, 40. We are familiar with the story of Lazarus, their brother, in John chapter 11, who was sick, who died, but was brought back to life. There's also the story of the anointing that follows that, that takes place again, we're told, at Bethany. And there are other stories that are perhaps not as familiar, that are associated with this village of Bethany. Like the story, for example, of the casting of the fig tree, the fig tree that dries because there was no fruit on it. Also, Luke tells the story after Jesus' uh, resurrection that he's heading toward Bethany when he encounters the disciples. And he tells them, all authority has been given to me. Go therefore to the ends of the earth. And as he himself is taken up into heaven. So from these stories, in a way, that I started kind of picking an interest in uh, way back, one gets an impression that Bethany is a place of friendship, of hospitality, of service, Martha, of intimacy, of anointing, of resurrection, and of mission. And I was fascinated. What is this place? What was this place? Why was it so significant? I accordingly and I took this three-week research trip in order uh, to, fi to find out. And I discovered a number of interesting details. It would be interesting, actually, for some of you who are biblical scholars uh, to kind of see um, what you make of my, my discovery at, uh, at Bethany. One, I discovered that during Jesus' time, this village of Bethany was on the other side of the Mount of Olives, Israel, Palestine, Jerusalem is a small place, but standing at the center, the upper room, you can see the Kedron Valley, and going up Mount of Olives. On the other side is the village of Bethany, the present day al Isaiah. It was a poor village. That's the name Bethany, from two Greek words, Beit Ane, house of misery, house of the poor. This is actually where all the poor, the marginalized, the social outcasts, the lepers lived, those who dared not enter the city, either because they couldn't afford to or because they would make everyone 
and clean. This is why we get a story like in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is at supper at the, at the home of Simon the leper at Bethany. Nowhere else would this happen but at Bethany. The other thing that I found out that is very interesting, that Jesus always stayed there. You know, his public ministry, he came in and out of, Bethany, of Jerusalem, but he never stayed in Jerusalem. He always stayed at Bethany with the friends, of course, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and all the other. I found that very, very significant, and so I wrote this book, Stories from Bethany, on the faces of the church in Africa, to kind of get a sense of what it means to be a church in and of other poor. He came to dwell among us, especially the us who are at the margins of power, the margins of economic, political, and, and social, social power. So much has been written about the shift southward of world Christianity. I mean, Sane, Bediako, and Wars, Erica, and others. We all live now in this southern, southward shift of world Christianity. But also much has been noted that the coming of this third church ushers in a church of the poor, where the typical Christian, according to Jenkins, is a poor African woman or a woman living in a, Brazil, a Brazilian favela. This calls not only for a shift in the way we understand church, but the way, the way that we do theology in order to suggest and recover an ecclesiological vision of the church as a church for and of the poor. The church, Pope Francis notes, is like a field hospital after battle. And as a field hospital, the church always steps outside her institutional existence and finds, I quote, new roads, new pathways to the frontiers, to the margins, end of quote, to the Bethany's of our time. Pope Francis, I quote again, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets, rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own sexuality. In Evangelii Gaudium, end of quote. The church, therefore, is always on mission, or rather, the church is mission. This mission consists in the first place, consists of this in three um, instances. In the first place, it is a mission of presence. Learning to be at home at Bethany. Thus, recreating the same experience of love, of intimacy, and anointing as Mary of Bethany. The mission also, in the second place, consists in service, not unlike Martha's generous, innovative, and dynamic leadership, meeting everyday needs, everyday material needs of labor, of land, and lodging. Everyday needs. And in the third place, the mission consists of being part of the dynamics of everyday resurrection initiating historical processes that allow the poor to reclaim their agency, that allow the poor to become masters of their own destiny, and in so doing, the church heeds the call to unbind Lazarus. When Lazarus rises from the dead, still bound, just says, unbind him, let him go free. Together, when the church brings this ministry of presence, of service, and resurrection, the church becomes a form of poetry. The church becomes a form of social poetry, converting death into life, injustice and poverty into new possibilities, especially new possibilities around these basic requirements of everyday life. This is the ecclesiological vision 
that undergirds and sustains our engagement at Bethany Land Institute. Bethany is just the short form of this ecclesiological vision, which also helps to crystallize and to focus the various programs at the Land Institute to this ecclesiological heart. At the heart of it is this ecclesiological uh, vision. Looked at in this way, Bethany Land Institute is involved in a similar, sorry, sorry, looked at in this way, at Bethany Land Institute, I am involved in a similar investigation as in my previous work of the reality of the church. My hope is that BLI provides a portrait of what the church is and can be in the midst of Africa's social and ecological crisis. At any rate, I am convinced that it is through such a portrait of the social poetry of the church in the global south that the church globally can recover the grammar of hope, can recover the grammar of hope in an increasingly confused and dispirited world, a world that is facing many social challenges, ecological crisis, COVID-19, the growing gap between the rich and poor, political uncertainty, a world that desperately needs to recover its spiritual center, its spiritual anchor. And for this, we need a fresh imagination of love, a fresh imagination of peace. Let me conclude. In the poem, Making Peace, Denise Levetov writes, a voice from the dark called out, the poets must give us imagination of peace to oust the intense familiar imagination of disaster. Peace, not only the absence of war, but peace, like a poem, is not there ahead of itself. It can't be imagined before it is made, can't be known except in the words of its making, grammar of justice, syntax of mutual aid. A line of peace might appear if we restructured the sentence of our lives are making, revoked its reaffirmation of profit and power, questioned our needs, allowed long pauses. A cadence of peace might balance its weight on that different fulcrum. It is this different fulcrum that I'm searching for, that I'm trying out at Bethany Land Institute. And in so doing, being engaged in a form of social poetry, a poetry of love, the poesis of love, grounding this poetry, ground this mission effort in the soil, in the land, at Bethany. And trying to recover in the process of doing so, that logic. The logic, like a poem, that is not there until it is made, that kind of circularity in a way, that invites more and more of me to find myself as a scholar practitioner involved in the implementation of the very reality that I'm investigating, that I'm studying. And in so doing, discovering at every stage, recognizing at every stage the serendipity involved in this kind of work, in this kind of poesis, in this kind of investigation. Levitov says, a line of peace might appear, a cadence of light might appear. Might? But perhaps that is the very nature of hope. Thank you.
instantiation of the theology. And it was impressive. Thank you. I think you're We correct. have some time for questions. If you'd like to pose one, I would ask you if you would to identify yourself since Professor Capongoli doesn't know all of us. Uh, and make sure you pose your question as succinctly as you can. As I like to say, disguise comments as questions, if you would. Uh, so the floor's open. Eric, and then I'll follow you if no one else does. <laughs> integrated into the seminary programs. It reminds me a little bit of some of the innovation being done in Brazil uh, with Dom Helder Comedy and Hesifi and like the, the land pastoral. And yeah, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how the seminarians, you said it's like four months, but a little bit more of how they're integrating that into their studies. Well, yeah, thank you very much, Eric. This was m one of the most surprising aspects, and actually, when the bishop called and said where he wanted to send seminarians, and he said, actually, first of all, he said he wanted to send five seminarians. Then he said, to my, no, no, I'm sending 14, all the, semina all, all the seminarians. And then he said, well, we're going to put them. We don't have uh, in, in, in enough dormitories. So they had to shift around. The director says, oh, no, let's, this is a great opportunity. Let's take all the seminarians. And so they told the seminarians, and part of it is the gift of COVID, because they were at home. The, the, seminary were, the seminaries were closed, and so uh, the seminary, seminarians were told, and they told, they, those I talked to said they didn't like it a bit. <laughs> so, but of course the bishop had asked them to come, and so, and, uh, but their, first of all, one, their experience reading Laudato Si in practice, uh, working with the other young people, uh, getting this kind of formation, but already just working with the hand, especially with seminarians, most of our seminary formation is very not only scholastic uh, in, in, in Africa, but also is so detached from these kind of everyday realities, let alone land, soil, as I said, that has been completely in a way looked up with suspicion as the kind of uh, the focal point of all that is heathen, that is pagan, and things like that. But what, according to their testimony, what, in a way, a liberating experience that that was, not only learning practical skills, but really uh, learning uh, ways of ministry. So that when they left, they said, oh, they are going to come back over and over. In the meantime, the bishop decided that, okay, from now onwards, all the seminarians will at least spend four months during their holidays uh, uh, at, at, at BLI. So there is a seminary formation going on in its usual ways. And then during their, home, their holidays, this diocese is sending their seminaries to be at BLI and requiring its pastoral agents, priests, catechists, and others also to spend time. The, the goal being that since this is a rural diocese, we would like all our pastoral agents to be grounded. So, but in the meantime, Another bishop called me to say, hey, I hear that uh, you're doing this that thing and so forth, and that Bishop Paul is sending his seminarian. Do you have room? I might want to send my seminarian. So I am hoping, actually, that the seminary formation program itself, actually, becomes a kind of land institute that in the midst of studying uh, Hegel and Heidegger and Thomas Aquinas, these are very, very important figures, don't take me wrong, right? they're very, very, <laughs> very, much, very much needed, especially by the church in Africa, they have to be grounded in this kind of, <laughs> yeah, 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 in the midst of something, take a break, uh, half a day, work in the fields, connect with the local population that are working in the fields, get a sense of the rhythm of everyday life, that's kind of sense of, that's, that's, that's our hope, that this will eventually, hopefully, uh, be interesting enough so that other dioceses may begin, uh, not only, first of all, to send uh, seminarians to the Land Institute, but may institute that kind of programs, and maybe finally then, uh, the church says that we need maybe to readjust 
and the seminary formation. That, that is my home. For a church that is predominantly rural, and African communities are predominantly rural, uh, how do you resist that kind of ideological temptation, ideological onslaught that says the only way to survive, the only way to develop is move to the cities, forget about the land. So you spend a whole year without even in the rural parishes hearing any sermon, any preaching about land where the majority of the people are living. So that's a, the kind of thing that in a way, hopefully, that would become part of the everyday structure of seminary formation. But right now, it's just a very modest beginning, and, but we have a lot of hope uh, with uh, the gesture that Paul did by sending the seminarians to the program. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, Kenyan environmentalist Wangari Maathai in the Greenbelt Movement planted a million trees as well with her women's movement. So uh, my question has to do with, is there a room for women in what you're in, in this movement here? I, I noticed that all, all of your young caretakers are men, which gives them an advantage, or at least it, it looked like it. Maybe you have more information there. So that was my question. Yeah, thank, thank you, Michelle. Perhaps the pictures didn't show well, but I think they are not all men. Okay. They are. Maybe. Do you have any women there? Yeah. Uh, over to the uh, left hand side. Yeah. But but I think that you're you 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 you're right about the, the question you're raising. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is the gender issue. Um. The majority of agriculture in the rural communities is born by women. Women do most of that kind of food production. When it comes to uh, institutions, the farm schools, for example, you find that most of the people who go to the farm schools are men because that is connected with income, with cash, because when they finish, they get a job and they get income and so forth. So. How do you reverse that? We're doing a lot of publicity to attract women into the program. But also there is another ideological uh, undercurrent at work. Young women, girls and so forth, they, many of them cannot see themselves grounded in the soil. Uh, their vision their most of, for most of them is not only to go to uh, college if they're able to, but perhaps to work in a supermarket, that kind of thing and so forth, in a way in professions that would not really involve them in actually actual land. The problem is that by default, most of them actually end up in the rural communities where they have to feed their families actually working the land. So we are trying to make the argument that instead of trying to, uh, you know, sort of Finding one self in the village, but that kind of default and being a woman, kind of uh, bearing it because you have to. How about to you get an interest early on uh, in this kind of program that can actually uh, empower not only skills but the kind of formation, but also the economic dimension of it. So right now we have actually uh, of the thirty. First of all, there were 16 uh, caretakers before the seminarian in the first class. So we have only five girls. Uh, and one of them, after mm, during COVID, went back home and she didn't come back. So, But we are trying very desperately, in a way, to attract more young women. One of the things, and we have a wonderful woman who is heading Martha's Market. One of the things that she has said that, Let's do Martha's Market. Let us put up, for example, connected with Martha's Market, um, the hospitality, because we have a guest, guest wing. We have the marketing. Let us market these programs and so forth. They will be a key that will attract more uh, women into the program. But it's very, very crucial in terms of this residential program. But these caretakers are working in the communities. For the first five years, they have a partnership with three village communities where they are actually working these caretakers with women, especially raw women in those, the, 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 those communities. But we'd like to see more of these women become leaders and so come into the institute 
uh, and there are a number of other challenges, but I think, I think you are right. We, we, we are doing the best that we can, and perhaps we need to do more, but there are some challenges that we need to overcome, uh, especially since most of these are 19, 20, 23, they're still young. Many women at that age, they don't see themselves uh, working uh, on the land, in the soil, farming like this. They are hoping that their chances perhaps will be uh, elsewhere. We'll take one last question, I'm sorry, but I saw Olive hand first. We're a little over time, maybe you can ask it afterwards. Hello, Father Tatobore, my name is Awa Dandimikal. I'm dean of the chapel here, and I was at the Notre Dame for a brief period, and I remember you fondly. Oh, mm -hmm. I don't expect you to remember me, it's very brief. Um, I wanted to ask you about the care, I was gonna ask about the relationship between the caretakers and the community, but really what I want to ask is about the caretakers themselves. Do most of them come from the local community, or are from, is they from elsewhere? And the second part of it was, what impact are you seeing in their own spirituality, their own theology? Uh, not the seminarians, but specifically the, uh, the caretaker. Yes, most of these are from the local communities. We have given ourselves the first, for the first five years our recruitment uh, area to be in and around in under the parish so that we can at least see the effect after two years if they go back, when they go back uh, in, in, the, in their communities. So they are local and most of these, as I said, they are falling off the education uh, uh, system. They are back to the villages and so they are kind of seen as, 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 as failures. There was the, an image that I showed earlier on. Let me see if I can capture that image again. Yeah, that is, this is the image. When we started working with the young people. So I brought this, the, 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 these young people on the ground and we started cultivating a bit. Um, yeah, let's see. But they were not really very convinced about uh, integral ecology. Um, and now when we built this campus and we're moving into the campus, we said, oh, we are going to move from this land, actually, we are going to uh, Nandele, where we're going now to start formally the program, very, very serious program. And uh, the director, we hired a new director, the director came to explain how it's going to be, uh, integral ecology, sustainable agriculture, completely total, total uh, organic, no pesticide, a number of these young people, even though they had been working with us, said, it's not going to work. Uh, everybody uses pesticide and so forth. And if you insist on kind of growing food locally and so forth, our tomatoes, and uh, they're not going to be as beautiful, as shiny, and they're going to rot after a few, yeah, we need to kind of use the chemicals. And, but the director insisted, no, no, no. And so they came, uh, a lot of them came to the institute formally, but very reluctantly. And she started. So uh, when I was back in July, I was just actually amazed uh, at how passionate the very young people that had resisted in a way that didn't fully think that it's going to work, what the transformation had been. And so I asked them, why? What's the difference? And they said two things. One, they had started actually studying and reading Laudato Si um, with the seminarians. Uh, the priest who was teaching them, uh, breaking up in small groups, reading it in vernacular, uh, local language, and they had begun to grasp actually these concepts. And two, this new director, um, who is really uh, passionate, a leader, a mentor, and so forth, started working with them one-to-one, -one, and in the classroom, but most important also in the fields, okay? Let, let, let's try it. Let's just say it won't work. Let's try it and so forth. And lo and behold, their pro produce <laughs> was surprising. And they said, we, we thought we're not even going to make money. We are making money, they said. <laughs> we, we are making money. We are now actually selling our crops and our produce, the, the countryside, the markets, the villages, and we're telling them this is purely natural, organic and so forth. And people actually are buying. So they feared that we're not going to, to be able to do that. And so they really, really, uh, within four months, uh, the transformation that I had seen was just kind of amazing. And so I was kind of playing devil's advocate with them and say, really, do you think this is really going to work? Or how is it going to be after two years when you go to the, the communities and so forth? And they were all kind of 
really going over what they wanted to do, uh, in Pigare, in what. So there seemed to be a lot of excitement from, uh, from the young people, the caretakers themselves. And hopefully, they can carry that uh, fire uh, forward, going forward. Yeah, thank you.